Hello and welcome to the next session of the Corona Summit. And I'm excited to have with us Dr. Bridges. He found his purpose by helping people be free from pain at a young age. As a healthcare consultant, he regularly shows his commitment through transparently communicating and being vulnerable on how he has overcome a life of physical and emotional pain. He credits regenerative functional lifestyle medicine and receiving mentorship as a key component in his physical, mental, and professional transformation. In his relentless pursuit of personal and professional growth, JR has played an integral role in replicating a proven integrated model of care in more than 100 clinics worldwide. Each clinic aiming at redefining healthcare, empowering medical leaders and patients to co-create health and impact the world. He is driven to make the greatest contribution by changing the healthcare can be delivered by implementing restorative medicine protocols, medical marketing and sales, practice management, and medical leadership development. Medical professionals and patients need and deserve the time to listen, connect, and co-create a transformative plan of care together. JR believes healthcare without personal growth, movement, and nutrition is the foundation. It's not healthcare. He is the husband and father of four, two-time number one best-selling author and international speakers. Welcome to the summit, Dr. Burgess. It's so good to see you here. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be on here and share and honored that you would have me helping other corporate leaders and executives figure out their leadership game so they can take their businesses to the next level. So I'm sure you didn't wake up one morning and go, I want to be a doctor. I want to help change healthcare. I'm sure that's not where it started. So tell us a little bit, like, tell us your journey on how you became a doctor and all the things that you're doing. Yeah. So it started, you know, at a, at a young age, I was teased really bad in the fifth grade. I was stood up by my mom had an enemy, which was this teacher um, growing up. And essentially she stood me up on the desk and said, I had low cartilage in my ears and flicked my ears. And I remember just being so embarrassed because I had a crush on the girl sitting right next to me, but I was mortified, embarrassed. So I didn't go to school anymore. I wouldn't. So my mom let me would play sports because she wanted to get me out of the house. But as going back to school, I then hated leadership. I hated mean people. I hated anybody telling any sort of rules. I just wouldn't listen to it, especially if people were mean or not kind in the process. But I was so thankful because I got into sports big time. And that would be the one thing that could shut my mind off. Instead of thinking or being sad and depressed, I would just dive in deep to learning the best that I could be. But seeing the whole team, seeing the whole playing field, what were the other team's strengths and weaknesses. So I, I really would have never developed my vision or empathy without seeing other patients in pain. So my jock friends would tease the nerdy kids and I would want to go hang out and help the people that were in pain. So my destination became my greatest gift of S empathy, but also strategy. And looking back now is I can see a lot of people have innate abilities at a young age. So as after those times, I really struggled with authority. I struggled to get any sort of good grades in classes. I got kicked out of everything. But what I really was good at is people and relationships and sales and being an entertainer. When I was on sports, I would love that more than anything. So for people listening that always maybe don't have a 4.0 or they've had the most success in school is I always say, if it's not fun, run. Meaning I loved my sports. I love people. I love the kindness. I love entertaining those sales skills that your normal school or curriculum maybe doesn't position you as like the studious rule follower and everything that it would be that, Hey, if you or your children didn't have it all together, but you're in your passion, you love leading people, you are in a position of influencing others, even though those people typically struggle more than school that people think their past always defines their future leadership. And, and I believe otherwise in all regards. I totally agree. Cause I think that, you know, you can be labeled and you can live into those labels. And if you live into those labels, sometimes that can be a total detriment to everything that you're creating. I mean, I have a really high IQ and my teach, my math teacher told me I was a dumb blonde and wouldn't amount to anything. So I, I definitely see that that can't, you can live into that or you can go totally opposite. I'm like you go rogue. I make my own rules. Our kids, my kids know that we make our own rules. Yep. And so I like to challenge the status quo of rules and rule following too. 
Absolutely. And that's, that's the truth is I've this to get to that point, it took years. So the motivation, I always knew I was a good person growing up, but to prove that teacher wrong, it was, that was the fuel I need. And a lot of people are driven that way. When somebody tells you, you can't, you're, or tells you those mean words, you will either go the other ways to let me prove people wrong. Or again, you can become victim to those words that happen at one point. And I'm not saying those people, those teachers aren't mean or they didn't have bad intentions, but it's like, it doesn't have to define you. Those can become your moments to really propel you to the other side. And I really believe strongly that everything happened to us to get us to that next level when we do have the right leadership and mindset to turn that story into something good. And faith has really helped me with that. So that was part of the journey along the way is I, in order to deal with the traumas, even though I wanted to succeed in sports and the things that I love, it's, it created a lot of other ripples and learns of challenges that some rules are good, like eating well, sleeping well, taking care of, you know, first things in yourself so you can do other things well are, are some of the rules that I've learned. Okay, those are there for a reason because if there was a rule, I would like to not follow it. And even in corporations, I used to, growing up, didn't like rules and authority. I would get mad like when people weren't, weren't friendly or didn't give an extra gift. But then when you get in the corporate side, you learn certain rules are good. And But yet, how do we build in accommodation and experience and not hardcore rules as we're going through leadership to have like an amazing culture, but a high performing culture at the same time is a fine blend between, you know, rule and, and freedom and authority and flexibility and accommodation. Those are, are things that had to be learned al along the way. And I think true leaders empower leaders. They don't just tell them what to do. They'll also be doing the work. Like I think lead by example is like probably one of the tenets of how I live my life. I don't ask anyone to do something I haven't done. I'm usually frontline doing it first before asking anyone else to go through it. And I think that that's like, that's what shows other people that you too are just like them, that you're not pointing and saying, do this, do this, do this. That, that doesn't really work in leadership. Leadership is what do you do best? Let me help you that you can help the team with your geniuses that are different than John's geniuses that are different than Aaron's genius, right? Like, I think that that is true leadership, not just telling people what to do, but doing it and showing the way. Yeah. Leadership is, is a handful of things to me and certain it starts with, I mentioned of seeing the whole field, the whole business is leadership is having vision and being able to communicate that clearly with the team. I always say, well, what skill should I learn? Should it be another communication? I said, if you're not a communication master and you're trying to either climb the corporate ladder, ladder influence more people, have greater sales, have greater relationship, communications at the center of it. That's not, again, like you mentioned, talking at people and telling them what it's doing. It's portraying vision, it's listening, it's reflecting, it's emotional intelligence, and not my early days in management, I, even I was so committed to having a world-class patient a journey for our, our patients. If like a trainer was late or somebody was behind, I would get upset and I would get reactive as opposed to now I could say if that same trainer or, or team member was late, I'd say, is everything okay at home? Well, why? Yeah, because I'm concerned you, you, ha you didn't make your, your shift on time. I want to make sure if there's anything I can do, if there's anything I can help, well, no, I, my dog got sick or the kids, all right, I completely understand. Um, and as you know, you know, we want to be here to help our, our team members. Is, are, do you still understand the importance? And, and I said that probably wrong. It's been a little bit while since I'm in day-to-day -day management, but um, you understand the importance of us being here on time. So, you know, if there's any accommodations we can do or arrange, so you are being able to be here on time, I want to let you know we're always here for. And something's hard going on, we'll cover for you and have the day off. That's what teamship does. But you understand the importance of us for our, our patients and clients being on the time. Yes. So the minute if you yell at them or defense, walls go up. So if what you have to say is important and you need the, the sender to receive, your delivery is the most important factor. And most people have words that shut people down right away, as opposed to opening them up to connection and dialogue and self-accountability. That employee knows they shouldn't be late, but you're the bad boss for making and calling it out versus being the leader that sees that. So it starts with vision and communication to me.
And I think that's curiosity. Like you said, I'm curious, why, why are you late? Is something happening, right? Curiosity is the thing that does bring down walls. If, you, you know, there's been times where I had to confront someone and I said, you know, I'm really curious about this. The person, the way you showed up during this, in, this instant is not the person that I know you to be. So something's off. And I'm really curious of what that is or how I can help you in that. And it was her opening up, the walls came down and she's like, here's really what's happening. And I had no idea. And I was like, okay, great. So what's the next steps we can do? But it's curiosity instead of just yelling at people because we know that doesn't really work. It doesn't work. So you, you hit it a home run right there is people don't care what you know or that you're the boss. They care how much you care. And I'm sure you've all heard that is you got to open people's hearts up before you can open their wallets or them following you in leadership. So whether that's sales, marketing, um, or leadership, it's they have to know you care if you want to be followed. So, so many people on the authoritative side have it wrong. Doesn't mean you can't be firm, but you should be fair and care. So doesn't mean you can't be firm, have great expectations, solid boundaries, high performance expectations, but you must care and you must be able to communicate to make that happen. And that's where it's all about for me. And Healthcare is we have got past communicating. Egos are getting in the way of corporate leadership success as well as business success. Because at the end of the day, if we look at healthcare, we are the last in the nation when it comes to chronic disease and chronic pain management. So right now we have the surgeon saying, oh, I'm the best. And this MD says, well, where does naturopaths or chiropractic land or they're just a personal trainer? Everybody likes dogging everybody else. But the fact of the matter is not one of them have the comprehensive solution. Because when we look at healthcare, is traditional allopathic medicine is there from symptom-based medication management. If people are going to have managed and have their insurance covered, they're not usually going to heal. All right? So, but that's needed. Half the world isn't going to take ownership, which we talk about in leadership as well, is vision, belief, determination, passion, conviction. I, I can get squirreled a little bit sometime, but at the end of the day is we have to be able to work together because at healthcare, it is physical, it is mental, it is internal, it is trauma, it is spiritual, it is relational. All these things impact your health. So too many people think they're the one to be all and they're not communicating and why I'm into leadership so much is because they haven't fixed it. So I help frustrated doctors all around the country and world add cash-based services like stem cells, functional medicine, and life that actually restores and regenerates health. And I help license and franchise their model to over 150 clinics around the world. And what happens is none of them have the entire solution, but they don't know how to communicate. They don't know how to refer. And in healthcare, that's not leadership. And playing sports, as I mentioned, being the background to tie this together now, gave me the foundation of what leadership and teamwork is. And I played college rugby and amateur rugby for 15 years of my life. And I think there's lessons that rugby can teach us in leadership and in healthcare if we're going to fix it. So if we look at healthcare is everybody's calling each other out. That doctor doesn't have the solution in this versus all of them are a part of it. And essentially, if we look at rugby, when you come together, you need 15 guys and you need the other team. They call it a scrum. When people's heads mound together, it's the most dangerous thing that could happen in rugby. People fall down in the cave, they could break their neck. But there's also strategy and offense of you need the other team to hold you up so we don't talk bad about them, even though I want to beat them and, and you know, try to show my dominance and presence over the competition. Like we want to try to put our competition out of business or beat them in, in most corporate settings or mindsets. So that's okay, but we need the other company to hold us up because we know we're at risk. But secondarily, you need all the people. My first time I'm a wing, I'm one of the fast guys that scores and runs and they needed me to come into the scrum. So the guy on the outside pulls me in and he's like, if you don't plant, then the other competition can spin us around. So that taught me another lesson. Everybody needs to be doing their role, even on the outside. You can't hide in isolation. You can't communicate. You can't be an armchair leader or a computer leadboard and wizard and expect to lead the team. Just like you said, they want to see that you've done it or on their team and are in there 
is a part of the game and experience with them to be able to see from their perspective. So that taught me that everybody has a role, no matter what, even not even the most talented, like some sports you play college baseball, you need all talented people. Everybody has a specific role and they're designed to do it the right way. But the thing I love most about rugby is you beat the crap out of the other team for 60 or 80 minutes. But at the end of the day, instead of like sports, it's just like you remain competition and not friends. Everybody goes to the bar, they're chugging drinks, we're, we're partying together and giving high fives and singing songs together and getting crazy. If healthcare could learn that at the end of the day, everybody's talking about everybody as competition or dogma or that they're the best versus if we're in healthcare, we should be high-fiving in leadership. If you are in your corporate VP and your sales and you're not communicating and high-fiving the marketing team, you're not the leader or the CEO type. You're not that caliber if you are staying in these pockets of isolation and not seeing perspectives. It's why do you think we're struggling in politics? The complete left and the complete right. It's somewhere in the middle of being able to see all perspectives. Otherwise, it's just divide and conquer. So if you're looking at leadership, it's the vision for the outcome of the goals. It's the care of the individual. It's the communication mastery. It's the being in there with them in a part of it and troubleshooting and understanding the whole picture and everybody's perspective and being able to listen sometimes. And I'm just so passionate about sports because there's so much to learn on what you can do and cannot do to, to win teams and cultures. It's just leadership is, is easy to spot and it's clear. Leadership isn't about gaming for yourself or platforming and taking rewards and winning and not taking credit. In fact, if you're leading, it should be we, we, we versus I. So in our healthcare model, it's we say the janitors just as important. If we're selling $20,000 stem cell packages and people are walking through our clinic, if it doesn't look like a pristine 10, then we're not going to show up like what our company is. So it's about making every person on the team a role player and a star and absolutely needed. Otherwise, in these tight times, you might as well get rid of them. If they're not going to the greater purpose or vision, it has no purpose. I love, because <clears throat> I played sports too. So I've, I actually play on an all men softball league and I've been the only woman to play on a men's softball league for three years. And what I also notice is the diff, like just even, you know, once when I play on co-ed, this is the funniest thing. When I play co-ed, some of the people get way more vicious and you would think not because you would think, okay, well, there's men and women. So men, you know, accommodate and not like try to drill a woman on the, on the pitcher's mound where I usually am. Mm -hmm. And, and they try to not like take you out when they're playing against each other. They don't think that. But the thing is when I watch just men play men, that doesn't happen as much. And the egos are put down a little bit and maybe it's joking and, and, and doing things back and forth. But I notice more competition in co-ed than I do in all men softball, which is so funny, but I think it also goes into how to communicate to the people around you. Men communicate a lot the same, right? When I play softball, I talk like a guy, I'm, I'm telling dirty jokes like they am. I'm saying, you know, crazy things. We're all having a good time and partying. They like it because I'm not, they don't have to act differently around me. Yeah. Right. And so it's that too, as a leader, assimilating to the, the team dynamic, right? Like looking at the team, seeing where you can fit in, seeing how you can help drive everyone to a better result. So I just think it's, it's very interesting to think about gamifying, uh, co-creating healthcare. Absolutely. And in this healthcare and business, and I'll, I will tie that this all together if you're listening and you're in corporate and say, how does this healthcare manage to anything is we wouldn't have went to the largest stem cell clinic in the, in the, the country or licensed our model and built the largest integrated practice that's independently not owned by a hospital in the entire country. That doesn't happen without leadership. We started from 1,000 square feet, went to 6,000 to 28, and started licensing our model. And because we were told we had to give up functional medicine stem cell, we lost our, all of our insurance contract. So it was going to other masterminds, getting coaching, learning how to be next level, connect in the community, sales, be involved, being a go-giver is what saved our practice and catapulted us. Even in, just like you're doing, Aaron is doing the summit and, and Desperate times for a lot of corporates that aren't certainty is bringing great talks of leadership and, and corporate leaders that are, are 
going to create change and disruption when the time is needed. And a lot of people weren't trained, nor was I, on leadership. You were trained by your parents or safety and security or by, by somebody that pushed their way. And that's not the new generation. It's not people. It's they got to be connected to your culture. They got to be listened. We got to learn how to lead virtually, whether we're in healthcare or in clinics. And if you don't have culture as number one, good luck. This is going to be tough for you to compete. So this is about leadership at, at all costs, whether you're in healthcare or any business. You look, they either have, according to good to great, level five leadership or people that are followable. And that's, again, to vision, communication, certainty that you're committed, you're determined, you're passionate, that the leader can be followed. So doctors are taught completely wrong in, in med school. They're taught, listen, follow the box, don't question, hear the symptom, here's the one problem. It's not customization, meaning every one of your employees is completely different. If you approach them all, just like you said, like guys, you can, some people can assimilate to a culture and fit right in. But when you're dealing with different generations, different cultures in the workplaces, especially the bigger your corporate is, different people that have either been abused or that like it direct, some like it passive, some like it aggressive, it's about learning your people and, and learning how to shift. Just like in healthcare, there's not a one size fits all model that works. So it's about the leader that can recognize each individual's passions personal goals and, and being able to feel, fulfill them both. So that is number one is we need that component of how do we necessarily learn how to have vision and leadership at the forefront of healthcare in business. And I always say it's your business is only going to go as far of your leadership. So they were taught listen and follow and that doesn't work in incorporation. It's just like you said, the rules. The second part of that is if you're told not to question, where does innovation come from? Where do ideas? So if you're in your boardrooms and you're not listening to everybody's input, it doesn't mean you have to take everybody's idea, but, oh, that's there and but. Those are words that kill versus allow that person to have that idea and say, yes, and we would, we'll look at that when we can get that. Even if you know that answer is that the words that you use are either going to shut people down or open them up to your culture. So yes, and versus yet, but, or shooting down anybody's idea. Make it all golden, otherwise you're in trouble. It's they won't open up, or they sit and talk to their friends, or they don't listen anyways. All that corporate lingo that you hear is they don't listen, they don't care, they're not open to ideas. It's probably halfway true if you don't know how to communicate or you have shut down your people, even though leadership always is, has to worry about the bottom line and making things work. So I get it. I'm an owner and on that other side, but it is a win-win relationship for everybody if anything's going to work. So that is the, the next component is you got to make the relationships win-win and you have to make it work. So in medicine, they're not taught win-win. It's follow the system and rules. And then they go to try to open their practices and then they want to tell people what to do or not listen or not hear both ways, and how doctors were trained makes them the worst leaders when they go into being business on their own. It works in a hospital or a volume-driven model where people are just go, but in a business where it's innovation and cash medicine and actually fixing healthcare versus following a pharmaceutical or corporate derivative that has special interests and profits before people, that is why we're in the, this, the way that we are. And there's a lot of corporations, again, the goal is to make profits, but if the goal is not to create passionate careers or brand loyalists, then you're missing the long game. Yeah. And my mom, so my mom's been in healthcare. My mom's been a nurse since I, she had took her clinicals with, when she, or, was, she was pregnant with me. She, then my stepdad was an anesthesiologist. So I've seen all of that stuff up close and personal. And I, when I even give ideas, because it's a small town in Idaho, I give ideas about business and how they could innovate and do different things. And she's like, no one would listen. The doctors are just so focused and all they know is more patients equals more cash. Get them in and out fast as you can, turn and burn, turn and burn. And I think in a lot of places, in, in industries, that's also what's happening, not just in healthcare, right? Turn and burn, make more money. And like you're saying, if you actually co-create with your patients, with your customers, with your clients, 
you have more things and you'll have them coming back to you instead of just being like, okay, well, I'll just do what you say. And, but it's not working. It's not working. It's not working. What else can I do? You know, I have a team of people. I have a chiropractor. I have a Reiki person. I have a shaman. I have, I have like all these things because not, you know, I've been going to the doctor for anxiety for a while and nothing helps. And all the pills they throw at me, I'm like, this isn't helping. It's making it worse or it's making me depressed. And I'm like, I don't want this. So I'm like, all right, let me find out what else I can do. But they're not even open to half the time when I say that I want other options other than drugs, right? You're hundred percent right. And that's Western healthcare. And where all this began for me is we started our practice. We were doing really good. And I went from developing one side to becoming the CEO of of the, the clinic and I had to learn practice administrative versus just my technical skills. So going to AAOE and we started licensing it already and a guy from NextGen, which is an electronic uh, health record or Athena, I should say, it was delivering this great keynote and he's like, and this was six, seven, eight years ago. And the guy goes, who's got the next innovation to change healthcare? And I'm sitting and containing myself and I'm hearing the same answers. Well, we could do this or more surgery or more prescriptions or another drug that, that could actually sue this. None that get to the root cause, none that weren't just profit centered. I'm like, I, so I couldn't contain myself. And I was shy and introvert. I had to learn how to get past my traumas and become an international speaker and go through a, a lot of different you know, journeys to overcome where I'm at now. And I'm not saying I'm perfect by any means and still everybody's got a next level is man, I stood up and I said, I have the solution. It's integrated medical fitness. And it was like crickets. And it was horribly awkward. And I didn't care. A couple of people came after me and said, Oh, that sounds like a good idea. And, you know, so it at least gave me courage to speak out there. But then I went back, which was last year, this is the largest orthopedic conference of executives, CEOs and leadership in the entire world. So it's uh, I won't give out the name here because the story that I'm about to give, but it's the best. So I started to build a name, started to license our model, and I applied to speak. And I finally got, instead of the regional conference, the year before I got to speak at the um, regional, I got to speak on the, the national stage. And there's a little roundhouse meeting right before the, the little breakout sessions. And it based on running your practice, how many providers you have. And they got around a circle and they were talking metrics. And again, I know business and I'm all about KPIs and numbers and building a, a, a consumer conscious, you know, model that, that makes a difference is we, they, they, their question was, how many of you, what is your top performing doc and what he sees during a patient? And one goes, oh, mine does 60. And they all go, ooh. And the one goes, mine sees 80 a day. And they're like, oh my goodness, the one lady across the, the side says, can he come work at our practice? And I sat there and listened to it for a minute and I'm building our model, which is the only one that's doing stem cells and PRP. These are all orthopedic and surgeries and I, in, in, in pain management. And I say, I'm sorry, you guys, is everybody's talking about innovation in business, but are you hearing what you're saying? We're again, still the most expensive, the most unaffordable, the most chronic disease and chronic pain and you guys are talking about 83 patients in a day is the hero badge. Let's just divide that by eight hours on an average day. That means the doctor has four minutes to spend with the patients, assuming he doesn't have to do elect his electronic charts and he's the only doctor in the world that doesn't have to, <laughs> assuming he didn't have to go pee or wash his hand, on best we could say he spent three minutes. I wouldn't want my mom to go to consider joint replacement or surgery or arthritis to have that care. I wouldn't want it on you, your children, you guys should all be ashamed of yourself. What we should talk about is how do we innovate and build world-leading outcomes? How do we make healthcare more affordable? How do we disrupt the current model? Not how do we force more people in the exam room is what we're celebrating. And I say, it's not your fault. I understand that we have to produce and keep the roles on, but this isn't what I'm hearing these think tanks or these world leaders combining and sitting here and discussing. There's no discussion on how do we improve the healthcare. It's all about, again, the business of continuing to operate the way we were. So the fact of the matter is, I went and delivered my keynote then, is it got people thinking, but there were still people offended by that. And I get it. So it's a tricky business navigating leadership right now. 
but there's corporate leaders that are frustrated. There's profits, there's shareholders. And, you know, um, are you able to see my screen if I'm able to share that a little bit? Is what leadership needs is innovation to stay competitive, especially right now. So if you guys aren't having your board meeting saying, how do we have a better patient journey or customer journey? How do we, again, there's a lot of grants, a lot of business stuff coming. How do we keep and retain these employees? How do we become better leaders and communicators, especially now that we're pivoting and going virtually? You guys are gonna get swallowed up by competition or the old model is gonna get obsolete. Um, and the next level companies, and again, nobody's perfect and we didn't learn, are gonna see competitive advantages when they're, they're utilizing the proper resources or learning how to lead and communicate. Um, am I able to share the screen or are they able to yeah, see Yeah, I can see it. Okay, I don't know if I'm able to get it to progress on this slide. Uh, this is my family now. It wasn't always this way. I have four beautiful children and, and a, a lovely wife. And I always say when people are saying, it's the government's fault, it's the insurance fault, it's you know the, the loan, the bank's fault. Everybody likes to point fingers, but every time you're pointing a finger, you're pointing it right back at yourself. So I want to teach my kids always in leadership is how do I be a part of the solution and not part of the problems? If you manage people, if you're leading, I know we all have pains when it comes to, oh my goodness, these employees and they're blaming versus again, as we talk, are you communicating and asking those questions? Are you doing it within 24 hours of what's eating at you or maybe an issue? I'm not saying I don't get mad or upset by poor performance or behavior. I'm saying I'm addressing it with a thoughtful conversation that will lead to a better outcome than what I did before I learned how to be a leader and communicate the right way. So that's, that's something I always recommend is how do you be a part of a solution? That's innovations at the table. You wanna be promoted. It's not, not that you can't state out a problem, Make sure you're, you're talking about potential solutions that would overcome it because I can't stand when employees just complain or gossip and grapevine and they don't have the courage to communicate because I will listen. So, you know, you want to get rid of the people once you allow to save space to communicate and be open to ideas that are just always going to be a part of the problem. Your job is to get rid of the players. It's just like what do world championship organizations do back to sports? They get rid of the, the, the right fielder that's not going to win them a championship. It, your team needs responsive, responsible role players that want to grow. You, you need growing people. And sometimes people in leadership and corporate are afraid of that because somebody will take your role. But so what? If you lead people the right way, they will lift you and elevate you. And there will always be a spot. The world needs good leaders. I don't know many leaders that struggle to get jobs over time. For sure. And so that, that's, yeah. go ahead. No, I think that's awesome. So physician roles, if we look in healthcare, this is just to maximize the statement is they can't, they don't have time. So they're not even talking to the patients at family care. So the only way to change healthcare is creating cash-based models or self-insured models. So I want to give you an example after a story of Susan is I want you to ask yourself and visualize the solution to reverse or better manage chronic disease and body, while building better profits in your corporation, while saving you thousands on your spend, while building a healthier workforce, a benefit-rich workforce that does produce happy employees and healthy employees, which I won't get into the statistics of all the benefits better employees do, but if not, healthcare pays for it. And guess what? Corporations pay for it most than anybody. The more you know, your workforce is inactive or the higher risk or the older potentially um, the risk factors are, the more this thing costs. So there are means to that we've seen self-insured companies save up to 80% off their orthopedic spend by implementing regenerative medicine protocols that are now evidence-based, that are now proven, that are, are systemized and back. And there's ways to break the pattern. And it began for me, and I won't get into my story, but here's an example of where healthcare is broken and what this matters to your corporation is essentially Susan came in, it was on 17 different drugs, had seven joint replacements, was very depressed and at her worst contemplating suicide as she had no other directions. The surgeon told her there was no more joints they could replace. The pain management doctor called her a drug chaser. 
because she needed it to, to manage. So she came to me and I said, I don't know that I'm equipped to help you. Let me get to you to Dr. Baumgartner. He's the regenerative specialist. Let me get you over to our functional medicine doctor. We looked at her labs, optimized her vitamin D, her, her, her thyroid, simple things that they don't do in managed care. Did what they call platelet-rich plasma. Did physical therapy, which is conventional. And we did nutrition and corrective exercise on our department's end. And three months later, she was off all but two of her medications, down 50 pounds, got her zest for vitality and life back. And we recognized we really could regenerate healthcare when we get people to take control of their own health first. When we start to learn how to move a little bit on our own, how to, to eat a little bit better, how to sleep a little bit better, de-stress, especially if we're in corporate, stress does lead to burnout and fatigue. So any company that doesn't allow 30 minutes or encourages their people, trust me, I'm a hard worker and I've only hurt myself by working those hours when I'm not giving myself at least 30 minutes of self-care time per day. So leadership that allows or encourages their team to take care, better care of themselves are going to perform better in the long run in relaxation. So how do we think outside the box inside of corporations to allow this work environment where people can take their own things into their hand? It's the only way people are going to get healthy, even in healthcare. If somebody comes in and says, JR wants stem cells, but they're unhealthy, bad blood goes everywhere. If they don't start doing some of the things on their own, we can't get them, but not everybody has the money in corporate. So how do we learn how to provide that digitally or at scale or affordably when there are so many mechanisms that we can help employee workforces get better? Then regenerate their, rejuvenate their health. That's IV therapy, supplements, nutraceuticals versus just covering it up. This can really improve the cell health and we can regenerate the body. So we started seeing predictable outcomes, started seeing the Minnesota Vikings, started seeing celebrities all around the world because we were getting world-leading outcomes with our regenerative healthcare process. So we went into our, our, our facility, which incorporated the medical fitness. Now, healthcare facilities or corporations, you don't need a big gym. This can be done virtually. They can have health coaching. They could have everything that you could ever imagine from their computers, their homes. But some of the bigger corporations do have spaces and facilities and think and sleep and meditation tanks and exercises and corporate wellness that can be delivered really, really affordably. But then I started seeing other celebrities and they put us in there. And from going from the voodoo doctors that do this functional and regenerative medicine, we're not taking their insurance. We won the Minnesota Innovation Award. We started our licensing and franchising model, became best-selling authors, went from locations. So medical fitness was our solution, but we recognize a lot of these doctors weren't good at business, just like corporations. If you don't have good leadership, it's only gonna go so far. If you don't have good managers or executives, management, people don't leave their job, they leave their leaders. You know, So leadership will take you places. We've seen people stay at Rejuve, even at less than what the hospitals pay because we are dedicated to their future innovation, a vision that people could buy into that's you know consumer conscious, that's environmental conscious. The, the millennial workforce are looking for a business that matters. Um, I know I do, even though I don't fit in that category, is I always want to be a part of something that matters. So we started license our model all around the world from Taiwan to China of these innovative models of care. We've seen other doctors that didn't have management or business or marketing know-how struggle this first couple of years as he learned leadership to now won a regenerative business award at our events and is helping do a full cash clinic. And we train other doctors around the world. Again, first and foremost, if you looked at the pillar structure is we wanted to teach them medical fitness and stem cell, we have to teach them leadership as the first step. And this is the same in healthcare. You can have these self-insured companies and do stem cells. If somebody's out on back insurance, that's going to cost them $150,000. They're going to be out of work for six months versus an $8,000 stem cell. We're seeing 90% reduce of surgery ever having to happen, a complete return to work, and saving millions off their orthopedic spends. And again, that's just the orthopedic side. When you add the healthcare, the corporate wellness, the different ways to take care of your employees right now, it's health, it's, it's healthcare is going to happen in corporations now because they're the ones that have to learn how to get lean, implement approach, save money. This is seen as an expense, but it's a benefit. And in nearly every case, especially if you start on the orthopedic side, 
we can prove a positive ROI and have white papers and everything when people do this strategically. So you need a healthy workforce. You need to think innovative right now. You need culture. You need leadership. And healthcare is where we can provide them the ultimate wealth. Because health isn't the ultimate wealth. It's actually everything. So if you have executives, if you have thought leaders that are burnt out and not healthy, you're only as strong as your health of your organization. If half your workforce is, is out sick right now, yes, there's some great grants and benefits, but you're not producing like the competition who's out there rallying in team and they're coming together and they're crushing it right now. So I know I rambled here, but that's what we do. And I think this is the perfect storm for healthcare and leadership to combine and in corporations and think how do we deliver health leadership and combine these things to really have a competitive advantage that is not out there right now. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Cause I think that <clears throat> everyone is facing, I mean, I think with the healthcare crisis right now, I think people are starting to really realize how much it affects everything else. Because if this wasn't happening right now, people would just be going on their normal business, not thinking about it, but it really has brought, you know, your own health to the front line to go, hmm, what am I doing? Am I being safe? Am I protecting myself? Am I burnout? out? Because by the time people have been sitting at home now for in Seattle, at least for at least two, three weeks, that people are like, oh, you know, I am so burnt out of driving two hours to work and back and working really hard and not eating right and not doing what I need to be doing. So I definitely think that's in the forefront of people's minds right now too. It is. So now's the opportunity. We're encouraging people to do it at home. Maybe they have more time. Maybe they're working from home, but this has woken a lot of people up. And that's why I started doing, I, I trained and helped doctors. I started taking in on all my doctors and started a new podcast of this series because the market needed it. I went grocery shopping um, Monday after this all started breaking out and I seen so many people putting unknowingly wrong things in there. And I thought to myself, they've heard that we have to get healthy right now to protect ourselves. They, they must care, but I then remember that I've had my addictions. I once loved my food, my alcohol, my drugs before I gave that up in pursuit of my ultimate calling and purpose. So I said, I need to educate these people that don't know right now. And so this is a competitive opportunity for us to provide our healthcare workers health, which is again, not only the greatest wealth, it's everything. So if we want to sustain and have people that are bought in and are culture-based, there's simple, affordable measures to make this happen right now. And even if you're the leader, even if you're the CEO listening, is do you want to retire at 65 and die? <laughs> Meaning if you are not putting your own health first in the leading, trust me, and this isn't with judgment, meaning I have worked my 100-hour work weeks to get where we are, and that was my own other form of addiction versus learning how to be, connect, and be healthy. I just fortunately love sports and being active. Otherwise, I would have been food is my, even though I love it. But the fact of the matter is, I know so many people that work their whole life and die with all the wealth in the world and they didn't have the health. So that answer is, again, not the left side, not the right side, not extreme, not complete sitting and doing nothing. It's always in the middle somewhere of, we need to take care of our health. We need to lead by example. I'm not saying not work hard, focus, determine, having your sprint weeks where, yes, I get as a leader, there's going to be the 70, 80 hour all out sprint or launch weeks. But then we got to learn how to be and lead and allow our teams to do it. Otherwise, again, we're going to have to shut down the economy because we're not at a place where we can withstand. We haven't built up the immunity to, to overcome stuff like this that will happen again on some level. Um, and or again, it will happen at 55 years old, stressed, and you'll have a heart attack like you hear so many people do. And accidents happen no matter what. But leadership is by teaching your children, your, your coworkers, your colleagues of what they would do to lead. It's not do as I say and not as I do. It's follow the lead and I'm pushing the way and showing the way. So I strongly believe, that could be wrong, is the the next century, the next 10 years, it's about leadership finally stepping through because people are waking up to profits over people or hidden agendas. Or again, you're going to have to figure out how to be virtual. If you don't have strong culture, you're going to have a tough time scaling and policing 
and seeing people that they're working 12 hours or three hours or turnover is just going to be the cycle. Next level leadership is going to win the game. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, thank you so much. How can people find more about you? Tell us yeah, where they my, can find you. Thank you. Um, I have two websites. If you're a doctor or practitioner looking to, to grow this, this Health Ovators is my brand for, for doctors. Um, so www.healthovators, like stand up, it's ovation. We're looking for medical leaders to stand up and actually build clinics that do transform health. And then jrburgessconsulting.com. That's where I do my speaking, my authorship, my blogs, my webinars, um, podcasts, and then consulting different businesses on the entire vision. Um, I have a few books on that website as well for, for people if they're interested. So thank you so much, Aaron, for doing the needed work of bringing leadership at the forefront, especially right now. Um, can't thank you enough for allowing me to share my message. Of course. So I have one last question. I ask everybody that's either on my podcast or has been on the summit. So I always talk about my future self and my future self, I named her ELJ, Erin Loman Jack. So ELJ is a $40 million business owner. She sits under the trees with Oprah. She's a New York Times bestselling author. She's got all of the goals done, right? She's a, so she, I bring her in when I need some advice on what I'm currently sitting at, whatever is in front of me, what's the next step, those kinds of things. So if your future self came to you today, what would he tell you as some advice? Yeah, that, that's great. Is, you know, I think your shaman or whatever has done good as it's done good for me that and Tony Robbins and all, all of the network is I have sit down and part of my meditation because my mind goes, I don't meditate well, but I do visualize, I do really look into the future. So I've clearly seen just like you're doing is I'm on, you know, massive stages of 65,000 people and at the United Nations encouraging healthcare leaders. I take my family, I travel and see the world and I go out to the top of the highest mountain on every vacation and look over and just be. That's where I'm at my presence closest to my source and do that. But what my guide had to tell me is, JR, all your values, you got some good ones and some bad ones from your parents. You've adjusted the good ones, learned a few of your bad ones is you need to build your values to the person that you need to become. So to me, a year ago, that was freedom. I don't like the rules. I want to succeed. Um, it was passion. Only do what I love. But that wasn't going to get me to my highest calling, even though they're good, strong core values. What they turned to was joy, fun, and love. Meaning I already have all those things, all the success. So my person would tell me, Yes, yeah, you're determined, but you were so much fun when you drank and were the life of the party where you gave that. You're so much fun as a kid growing up, even though society may have saw that as an outcast is, man, your kids deserve the fun dad. Even though I'm not fun, but work doesn't always have to be serious. It's there, but I can be hardcore and firm right there. So making um, fun and love, because those are the two things that kept me addicted or driving or looking for more is love wasn't the number one value of what I needed. I'm already driven. I'm already successful. Those things, I don't need those as my core value. They're part of my identity. I need my values centered towards what I'm working to be and become more than anything. I love that. Well, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you sharing with us on this summit. And, you know, like I, like you said, there's, there's so much opportunity right now and it might look like rough seas, but know that it definitely is a call for you for all of us to step up in a bigger way and show up differently. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you.